It's good to be back. I was gone last week. How many of you knew that because you were here last week? How many of you were here last week and didn't realize I wasn't here? No? Okay, a couple of you. Fair enough. Fair enough. I had a comment. So, no, I just want to first thank uh, Joe and Dorley Dalkey for stepping in and helping last week. Uh, uh, Dorley uh, obviously spoke for those of you that were here, did a great job. And Joe helped uh, facilitate the service and the announcements and the offering and things like that. So, thank you for helping me out while I was gone. Um, we had family in, and Sam was. His hockey team was playing in the state uh, playoffs, and so we were there supporting him. So I'm happy to say that they won in a double overtime. So congratulations to Sam. He's a state champ. So, And uh, for those of you that don't know and that are keeping track, he is a back-to-back state champ. Uh, they won state last year as well. So uh, super fun and exciting. So anyway, we had a good time, uh, but uh, it's always, uh, actually this time here is always a highlight of my week. So I I do miss it when I'm not here, so it's one of those catch-22s where, where you, you're, you're happy that you're not here, and you're also sad that you're not here as well. So um, anyway, so we're going to continue on today. We've been in a series called uh, Defeating Your Giants, and uh, we're going to do step three today, or, or part three of this, and uh, each week we've been giving you one step on how to defeat your giants, and we've started off, I'll do a quick review for the last two weeks that we've been uh, talking about this, and obviously we're looking at the story of David and Goliath, and so we're taking different pieces of that um, and applying them to our own life. And so uh, week number one, we talked about how every one of us has a giant in our life at some time or another, that giants are just a part of life, and there's, we gave you different examples of giants. They could be financial giants, they could be relational giants, emotional giants, health giants, mental giants. There's a number of different giants that we could have in our life. And the one of the things that we talked about on week one is every giant falls. There's not one giant that will last forever. And so no matter what you're facing, no matter what giant's in your life, every giant falls. Your Bible and my Bible says that there is no name above the name of Jesus. And so no matter what the name of your giant is, it will fall to the name of Jesus. Now it may feel like it'll last forever, but it won't. And so the step number one in in fighting your giant is choose to get in the fight. Choose to move from the, from the sidelines to the front lines. And we talked about how in David and, the story of David and Goliath, nobody wanted to fight the giant. Everybody was scared. Everybody was on the sidelines. Everybody was looking for somebody else to take the fight. And we looked at a, at a scripture in Matthew chapter 5, verse 9, and it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. And we talked about how would you describe your life if you had a giant in it. And we gave you all sorts of examples, you know, stress, you know, you'd be, you know, it'd be tense, it'd be overwhelming, depressing, scared, all these kinds of things. But nobody said that they would describe their life as peaceful when they're facing a giant. Would you guys agree? Would you ever describe your life as peaceful? I would not. I've had a number of giants in my life, and no time when I faced a giant would I ever describe that as being peaceful. But Jesus says, blessed are the peacemakers, for they, shall, for they shall be the sons of God. Well, the difference between a peacemaker and a peacekeeper is a peacekeeper will do anything and everything to keep the peace except go to war. They'll give away their inheritance, they'll give away their voice, they'll give away land, they'll give away money, they'll do whatever they need to do to avoid a conflict. But we said when you have a giant in your life, it's not peaceful, is it? And so the only way that you're going to broker peace in your life is if you choose to confront the giant. And so a peacemaker understands that sometimes the only way to broker peace is to go to war. And so he said, step one to confront or to defeating your giant is choose to actually engage the giant. Get off of the sidelines and move to the, to the front lines. Part number two, last week or two weeks ago in, in the, on the second part of the series, we talked about stop listening to the voice of your giant. We looked at Goliath and we looked at who he was and how big he was and all the armor that he carried. And he's sitting there and he's shouting insults. And he's shouting, you know, all these things to the armies of Israel and to Saul and to everybody there. And the Bible says that they were all afraid. They They were scared. And why were they scared? Because they were listening to the giant. They were listening to the, to the words that were coming out of his mouth. And we told you last week, your giant will lie to you. Your giant will not tell you the truth. Your giant is not for you. 
your giant is against you. Your giant is looking to take you out or to depress you or to sideline you or whatever. So stop listening to the voice of your giant. That's step number two. Step one is what? Choose to get in the fight. Step two? Stop listening. All right, you guys are doing pretty good. I just gave the answers like a couple seconds ago, but it's all right. So here's what I want to talk about today. And initially, this third step, it's not going to sound all that um, insightful initially. It's going to sound kind of shallow, but give me some time. I'll unpack this, and I think you'll understand that step three is just as important as steps one and two are so far. And step number three is this. Be purposeful. I get it. It doesn't sound super engaging. It doesn't sound super inspiring. But let's talk about purpose for just a minute. Because purpose is something, purpose is a message that people connect with. Like there's something that God put in us that we just connect with this idea of purpose. That we want to have a purpose. We want to know what our purpose is. We want to be going after our purpose. We want to be engaged in a purpose. We want to know that our life has a purpose. Nobody wants to feel like their life is some accident, some sort of cosmic mistake. We want to know that we're here because we have, God has a divine plan, that God has put this thing together, that we're, we have a purpose. How many of you have read the book, The Purpose Driven Life? Like, this is an interesting book. I did some research on this in preparing for this message. And The Purpose Driven Life came out in 2002. How many of you have read that book? I read it. It was great. It was all about what? Purpose. It's kind of in the title. But let me tell you how impactful that book was. The Purpose Driven Life ended up being on the Wall Street Journal's bestsellers list. It was on the Publishers Weekly bestsellers list. It spent 90 weeks at the New York Times bestseller list. That's almost two years. A book about purpose, a Christian book written about purpose, spent 90 weeks on a secular newspaper's bestseller list. By 2008, it had sold 18 million copies. By 2012, it had sold 23 million, I'm sorry, 32 million copies. And by 2020, it had sold 85 million copies and had been translated into 85 languages. Think about that. In 18 years, this book was printed 85 million times and translated into 85 different languages. That should tell you something about how people respond to this story and this message of purpose. People want to know they have a purpose. We understand that at the well because our mission is what? Yes. <laughs> Guys, a little slow on the uptake, but you're getting it. Connect, discover, impact. That's what we're about. That's our purpose. What is that about? Connect. We want to connect with people. We want them to connect with God. Discover. Here's the big piece. We want them to discover the plan and the purpose that God has for their life. And then finally, we want them to use that plan or that purpose to make an impact. See, purpose is a big deal. So if you have your Bibles, we'll start talking about purpose. So turn them to Proverbs chapter 29, verses 18. Proverbs 29, verse 18, it says this. Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. Let's talk about this and unpack this for just a minute. So when it says there's no prophetic vision, sometimes we get kind of mess, mixed up or messed up or hung up with this word prophetic. What's it mean? What's it not mean? So let's just kind of remove that for a minute. Where there's no vision, the people cast off restraint. When I talk about vision, what are we talking about? So if I ask Brad, Brad, where do you want to be in five years from now? On a beach. What, which beach? Any beach. Um, somewhere where it's warm and sandy, right? Where you get lots of vitamin C, S-E-A, right? All right, good. So his vision is to be somewhere warm five years from now. Okay, do you plan on being working five years from now on that beach? 
You'd rather not be working. That's fair. Like, I'm with you. I, I feel like we have the same vision. And so, but here's the point. When I ask you, where do you see yourself in five years? Or where do you see your marriage a year from now? Or where do you see yourself in your job or whatever? You're going to have to tell me something. You have to look into the future. You have to create what that looks like. You have to connect with your heart or connect with your vision. Maybe connect with your purpose and say, I want to be at ABC or XYZ in this amount of time. Everybody tracking with me, right? That's the vision. That's where you want to go. Well, how do you get there? Well, you figure out in bite-sized pieces, in little steps, how can I go from where I'm at right now to where I want to be? So how can Brad go from driving a truck, taking MRIs of people, to five years from now just wearing flip-flops and hanging out on the beach? Like, like there's some steps. That doesn't just magically happen, right, Brad? Like, you probably have to keep Stephanie working. I mean, you'll be on the beach. But, you know, that I don't know if that's the best part of your plan, but that might be part of it. So, no. But here's my point. You have to have inter incremental steps to get from where you're at to where you want to be, right? So now what you then have to do once you understand what it's going to take to get you to where you want to go, you actually have to do it, right? Translation, you have to live every day with purpose. You see, the first part of that verse says a people without prophetic vision will do what? They'll cast off restraint, meaning this. So what does that mean? It means that, think about restraint as kind of like a seatbelt. Restraint is, is something that's going to keep you safe or keep you kind of locked in when the road gets bumpy, when there's an issue, when, the, when life isn't working the way you thought it would work. And what the Bible's trying to get you to see here is people can endure a lot of ups and downs and bumps in the roads if they understand where they're going. If they understand the vision, if they understand the direction and the why, this is why we're changing. This is why we're doing what we're doing. This is why we're changing this or getting rid of this or, or adding this. People can endure change and ups and downs and hardships if they understand the purpose behind the change. Vision is where you're going. Purpose is what you're doing. So if, if you understand that there's a purpose, you can be okay with the chaos in the moment. Is everybody tracking with me? But without purpose, if you don't understand where you're going and you don't understand why you're doing it, you're liable to just bail out. Paul said it this way. If you have your Bibles, turn to Philippians uh, chapter 3, starting at verse 12. It says, I admit that I haven't yet acquired the absolute fullness that I'm pursuing but I run with passion into his abundance so that I may reach the what? Purpose for which Christ Jesus laid hold of me and to make me his own. I don't depend on my own strength to accomplish this. However, I do have one compelling focus. I forget all of the past as I have fastened my heart to the future. Instead, I run straight for the divine invitation of reaching the heavenly goal and gaining the victory prize through the anointing of Jesus." What was Paul's focus to obtain the purpose that God had called him to? Paul says, I haven't obtained it yet. I haven't arrived yet, but I'm running with passion towards the very thing that God has called me for. He's, he's connected to his purpose, and he's moving after the purpose. And he says, one thing I do is I forget What's behind me? I forget the past. I forget the failed businesses. I forget the failed marriages. I forget the mistakes that I've made. I forget what people have told me that I'll never be anything or I'll never matter up. I'll never measure up. I'll forget those things because I'm more focused on what God's called me to be and I'm more focused on the purpose that's in my life. But sometimes there's bumps in the road, isn't there? See, Paul understood that everything that he did was working towards him fulfilling the purpose that God had called him to. Now, I want us to take a look uh, for a little bit at how, da how the Bible describes David. Now, two weeks ago, we looked at Goliath and we talked about where he was from. Anybody remember where he was from? Gath. Anybody remember? what tribe of giants he was a part of? 
Amalek. Somebody said it. Very good. Um, and you ever remember how big his, um, how long his spear staff was? It was like a weaver's beam. It was how long? 26. Very good. You guys listen. Fantastic. So, all right, so we went through Goliath, and we talked about who he was, where he came from, his weapons, all that kind of stuff. So I want to take just a moment and talk about David, the other part of the story. Obviously, he's the the underdog. He's the guy who obviously wins. But let's talk a little bit about him, and let's see what the Bible has to say. Now, we are eventually going to get to the story of David and Goliath, but before we get there, I want us to turn one chapter over. And so if you have your Bibles, again, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 16, and we're going to look at a verse. Now, the most well-known description of David is what? He is a man after God's own heart. Now, that's a great description. I would think anybody would be happy to have that description of uh, written about you, but I want to look at another description that gives us a little bit more to work with. So in 1 Samuel Samuel chapter 16, verse 18, it says this, one of the young men answered, behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. So that's how Somebody is choosing to describe David. Now, at this point, David is, he hasn't even killed Goliath. That happens in the next chapter. So, David, David isn't known. He isn't a national hero. He's a nobody at this point. He's just a young kid who's in his early to mid teens. He's watching his father's sheep. And this is how somebody describes a teenage boy. That's pretty impressive, right? I mean, I'm not trying to talk down to teenage boys, but uh, those descriptions would probably not be some of the things that I would choose to describe most teenage boys. Are you with me? Like, I'm not trying to be mean. I'm just saying, like, I would have other things to describe most teenage boys. But this guy describes David as the guy that, that God's with, and he's a skilled musician, and he's all these things. He's a man of war. The guy hasn't even fought anybody. But this guy describes him as a man of war. So let's begin to take this apart and apply it to our own life. And so the first part, it says this, that he's skillful in playing. Obviously, he's a musician. We know that. He writes the Psalms. He you know, plays the harp for King Saul. He's very musically gifted. But where did he learn to play? Most likely, he learned to play at home. Most likely he learned to really play while he was watching the sheep because that's got to be really boring most of the time because what they, they wouldn't just like take them out to pasture and then bring them home at night and store them in the barn. That's not what they would do. They would take them from pasture to pasture to pasture. So David may not be home for days or weeks at a time because he's out with the sheep. And so what would you do as a teenage boy when you're just surrounded by a bunch of sheep? Well, I guess one of the things that he did was he would play his harp. And he would just play his harp, and all he had for an audience was sheep and stars and God, but he played his harp. My point is this. He took advantages of the opportunities that were presented him. He wasn't like, this is boring, I'm not going to practice this thing, nobody's going to ever hear me, nobody's ever going to hear how good I am, this is stupid, this isn't going to take me anywhere. He He was purposeful in developing the gifts that God had given him. He was described as a man of valor. And what that means is he is actually willing to stand and fight regardless of the odds against him. He, would take, he took his responsibility seriously even when it meant that his own life was in danger. And you saw that multiple times because he fought the lion, he fought the bear, he fought Goliath. You know why I think he was so good about being a man of valor? Because we're not going to take the time to look at it. But there's a little section in the story of David and Goliath. And his brothers were just straight up mean to him. Like they were like, what are you doing here? Like why are you here? Like, like, Like keep your nose out of it. Like they were, to me it doesn't sound like just like brotherly kidding. It sounded like they were just mean. Like, like, you're just here because you're nosy. You're just here and want to be causing problems. You're just here to, to cause, stir up trouble. Like, like, if you had to grow up in an environment where you were constantly having to deal with that, good for you for being a man of valor. Because I think I'd be a man of war. Like, I mean, I get it, David was. But, but I think I'd be punching some people in the nose after a while. What about you? Like, uh, you know civil rivalry, but, I mean, good for David for, for learning how to handle that. He says he was a man of war, which is actually pretty interesting because he hadn't fought anybody yet. I mean, maybe the lion, maybe the bear, 
But no Goliath, he wasn't leading raids, he wasn't leading the army, he wasn't going and attacking any sort of Philistines or anything at this point. But he was talked about as a man of war. And what that actually means is he was a man of principle. That he wouldn't budge his, on his convictions or he wouldn't surrender territory that had been given over to his control and authority. That he was determined and committed to stand for what was right, even if it meant against all odds. And I think you can see that in David's life, can't you? The next one, it says that he was prudent in speech. And actually, I really think this is the best translation of this. It actually, a better translation is he actually had excellent business skills. He was business savvy. Now, it's kind of hard to see that in a young boy, but I think you can actually see that taking place because, a um, little Bible trivia, how many sons did Jesse have? Anybody remember? Eight. Very good. And David was, which one, in, in which section? He was the youngest. There was eight brothers. David was the youngest of eight. The story of David and Goliath tells us that his three older brothers were actually in the army, not fighting, but at least there being scared and intimidated. Um, but they were at least there, so they weren't at the family farm. So you've got three of the elders there, and you've got David watching the family flock. Where's the other three? Or other four? We don't really know, but we know that they're all older than David. Now, the why we think he's so um, business savvy and so responsible is watching the family herd in the flock was a big deal. Like, it wasn't this job that you just gave somebody just so you could just get them out of your hair. Like, like, financially, that was a big deal. Like, you would sell the sheep, you would get the lambs, you would eat them for meat, you would shear them and use their wool for clothes and all kinds of stuff. Like, it was really important to have a healthy, vibrant herd. You wouldn't just turn that over to just anybody. And David, being the youngest, is watching a really important part of the family farm. It says that he was a man of good presence. That actually just means that he just cared about his appearance. Like, like he was interested in health and well-being. If he was here today, he would probably be like the, you know, eating all the supplements, you know, and drinking all the protein shakes and all that kind of, you know, crazy stuff that really health people do. But he was interested in his health and his well-being. He wanted to look good. He'd probably have Manny Petties if he was here today, you know, but, I mean, they didn't have those back then. Um, but anyway, it said, the last one, it says that the Lord is with him. And obviously, he had a spiritual relationship with God. Obviously, he's, you know, connecting with God and, and worshiping God through his harp and all kinds of stuff. But how does a young teenage boy get to this place in life so quickly? It was on purpose. It was on purpose. Because let me help you understand something. Giant killers aren't born. They're made. You see, you're not born a giant killer. You're not born with this supernatural ability to face all kinds of overwhelming odds and it never affect you. See, giant killers aren't born, they're made. And let me help you understand the next piece. Giant killers are made in the mundane. You see, when nobody's watching, that's when a giant pillar, killer is made. When, when you think that nobody's going to see you, that this doesn't count for anybody, you're bored out of your mind, this is going nowhere, that's when a giant killer is made. So a giant killer isn't born, it's made, it's made in the mundane, and it's also made on purpose. You see, giant killers are made on purpose. You see, so I believe David got to the place that he was so quickly because he did everything with purpose. He understood that today mattered. No matter what I was doing, whether I'm, I'm watching sheep, whether I'm you know, playing with my harp, whether I'm practicing my slingshot, it doesn't matter. I am actually doing everything I do with purpose because today counts. Today matters. I told you at the beginning of, of our time together that I was gone last week because Sam, had uh, he was playing hockey this past weekend. And, and I want to tell you about a young boy on his team. Because this kid is amazing. Now, there's a, there's a young boy on, on Sam's team, and Sam's a peewee this year. And this boy actually is a squirt. And so for those of you that aren't familiar with hierarchy of youth hockey, uh, a squirt is below 
a peewee based on age and, and like skill level. And so you, you come in as a, a mighty mite, and then you graduate to a mite, and then a squirt, and then a peewee, and, and then on up. So this kid is a squirt. So, so he's younger than everybody else on the team. He's probably the smallest kid on the team. But let me tell you, he is the fastest kid on the team. This kid is amazing to watch on the ice because this kid is fearless. He's not the biggest kid on the ice by far, but he's got the biggest heart because to watch that kid skate, it, it does sound like, like, I don't even know how to describe it because what that kid can do on this little tiny metal blade on the end of his skate is amazing. And he's fast. And he will go and attack that puck. And more times than not, he wins the battle. And he gets the puck. And you watch him. And he swoops in and out and all over the place. And it's like the puck is just stuck to his stick. It, he never loses the puck. And he just fakes the goalie out time after time after time. And my point is this. It's amazing to watch that kid in his glory. It's amazing to see him excel at what he does. It's inspiring. But guess what? I get to watch him for 60 minutes a game, but I don't have to watch him practice at home and, and shoot hundreds of shots at the goal and miss and miss and miss and miss. And I don't have to be the one that picks him up off the ice when he's hurt and because he fell or he hurt himself or he did something. You see, this kid does everything on purpose. You see, he puts a lot of time in developing his hockey skills because he knows he wants to be the best that there is on the ice, and you can tell it. But see, I don't get to see all the hard work behind the scenes. And that's the way life is with giant killers, is you see, a lot of times we like to see the victories of somebody. We like to hear the story. We like to hear the moment, the battle. Tell me the war story of how you took down the giant. But nobody likes to hear about all the prep work it took. Nobody likes to hear all the you know, early mornings that you're up reading your Bible or the sleepless nights that you're praying yourself to sleep. Like that, I mean, yeah, good for you, right? But we're kind of like, let's just skip over that. Get to the good stuff. Get to the part where you take the head of the giant off. You see, you never get to take the head of the giant off if you don't take the opportunities in the mundane and you work on purpose every day. You see, a giant killer isn't made, or isn't born, it's made, and it's made on purpose. So let's talk about how the Bible would describe you. If we took the same thing that David was used to describe him, how would the Bible describe you? Now, I get it, you don't, some of you don't sing or, or play mus you know, instruments. Like, I promise you, the Bible would never, ever describe me as a great singer. Like, that's just not going to happen. Right, Brad? It's okay. It's the truth. It's just not going to happen. There's still hope. Yeah. It's small. It's, it's fading, but there's hope. Miracles happen. Miracles still do happen. That's right. That's right. But what are you skilled at? You're skilled at something. Maybe you're skilled at coaching. Maybe you're skilled at, at singing or cooking hospitality or making somebody feel comfortable or creative problem solving. Maybe you're just creative and you have these great ideas on how to present something or how to make something or how to fix a problem. Maybe you excel at leading or managing or, or conflict resolution and having hard conversations with people. What do you excel at? Because that would be the thing that you need to begin to develop on purpose. David said it was described of him as he was a man of valor. It means that he was willing to fight against all odds. Let me ask you this question. What is it that you're willing to fight for against all odds? What's that thing in your heart that burns that you're like, gosh, if I could just do anything, it would be this thing. If I, if I could get involved with anything, it would be this thing. What kind of social injustice would you fight against all odds? Maybe yours is, I'm going to believe against all odds in a crumbling marriage or a failing business or rising debt or failing health. But what is that thing 
that you're going to fight for against all odds. David was described as having been a man of war, which actually means he had a strong moral compass and strong convictions and principles. What would the Bible say about you? Man, he or, he or she is a man of integrity, of faithfulness, compassion, grace, mercy. How would the Bible define your principles? David was described as being prudent in speech or having business um, excellence, savvy skills. What are you good at? Some people are just good at, like, execution, right? Not of the death kind, but of, like, I hope nobody's good at that. <laughs> Unless you're, like, an American sniper, then maybe, but under certain circumstances. But execution of, like, you see an opportunity, and you know the right time to pull the trigger to make it happen. You see a good deal. You see the stock market make a move. You get in, you get out. Some people are just good at those kind of skills, some people are great at marketing strategies or connecting with people or conflict resolution. What are you good at? Because you need to begin to develop that on purpose. Is he a man of good presence? He took care of himself. Ladies, I'm going to do you a favor here. I really feel like you can make a strong argument for regular Manny Petties because it's part of your spiritual walk. Right? If David took care of himself, you probably could do the same. You getting ready with me? Maybe massage? This is also the great time, ladies, where you can buy your guys the nose trimmer that you were hoping he would buy. You know? You need to be a little more spiritual, so I bought you a nose trimmer. Take care of yourself like David. You know? Like, like it's okay to be like, I need to take care of myself because this giant killer needs to live a long time. This giant killer needs to be long on the earth because I got a lot of fight left in me. It's okay to, to care about what you look like and eat well and to exercise. And obviously, your relationship with God is super important. You know, you don't get great wisdom without hanging out with the one who gives wisdom, do you? You don't get great revelation or insight or teaching. or You don't get any of these great spiritual qualities in your walk with God if you never actually walk with Him. You see, did anybody ever walk on accident? You never walk on accident, do you? It's always on what? Purpose. You always walk on purpose. You see, living on purpose is really all about taking advantages of the opportunities that come your way. Everybody has opportunities. Now, I will tell you, not everybody has the same opportunities, but everybody has opportunities to do something on purpose. You see, David had opportunities to play the harp and get really good. He had opportunities to hone his skills at slingshots. I wonder, I mean, let's be honest. He's a teenage boy. I'm just trying to put myself into his shoes. Like, I would probably, I'm not like, I don't, music's okay, um, but I'd probably get bored playing the harp after a while. But you know what I probably wouldn't get bored with? Using the sheep as targets for my slingshot. Like, like can you imagine, like, David being like, okay, 20 yards out, I got that one dialed in. Okay, I'm going to take 30 yards now. And just seeing how many poor sheep he could hit with a slingshot. Like, like, I see him taking advantage of that opportunity. But my point is this. What opportunities do you need to take advantage of? Because they come in the most mundane ways. They come like this. I am so bored in this job right now. I am so bored in this relationship right now. I am so bored with this spot in life that I am. That's a great place to take that as an opportunity to do something on purpose. To develop yourself. Now watch this. We won't take time to turn there, but I want to give you something. Bible says, if you're faithful in little, you'll be faithful in much. See, so if you're faithful in the little opportunities, and you take the little opportunities to do something on purpose, that means that when you see a bigger opportunity, what will happen? You'll do it. 
That means that if you take advantage of the small opportunities, then you'll have a chance to take advantage of a bigger opportunity, right? Watch this. Turn to uh, the story of David and Goliath. 1 Samuel chapter 17. I love how David responds to this. Faithful in little, faithful in much. So let's start reading in verse 23. 1 Samuel 17, 23. So David is has now gotten to the front lines. He's on assignment from, from his dad. He's got a break from the, the sheep for a couple days. Um, he's excited to be at the front of the battle and on the, on the campaign. And he's, in verse 23 it says, And he talked with them, or as he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines and spoke the same words as before. And David heard him. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were much afraid. And the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his house, his father's house free in Israel. Which actually means they won't be paying taxes. In verse 26, And David said to the men who stood by him, What shall be done for the man who kills the Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? And the people answered him in the same way, so shall it be done to the man who kills him. You see, this is the day that everything changed for David. You see, before today, David was unheard of. He was the littlest kid of, of his family. Uh, Benjamin is one of the smallest tribes in Israel. Like By all accounts, David is a nobody. He hangs out. He doesn't have any friends or hardly any friends because he hangs out in the field all the time with the sheep. But he's a man of purpose, and he's taking advantage of every opportunity. And he comes to this place where he was faithful in the little opportunities. Now he's got a big opportunity. You see, he's listening to the giant, and he's listening to the armies, and he hears that the, the winner, whoever kills Goliath, will get riches and the girl and free taxes. And he goes, hold up, wait, what did you just say? You mean, you mean whoever kills this joker is going to get money, the princess, and free taxes? And he's like, why are you guys not doing this? Like, like, like Brett David's like, this is a no-brainer. Like, like, he goes, I've been trained for this day. Like, I took advantage of the lion, and I took advantage of the bear, and I took advantage of living with seven other brothers who talked down to me. This is the logical next step in my progression. Bring the giant on. You see, he took advantage of the opportunity that was in front of him. And what I want you to see is if you're faithful in the small things, you'll be faithful in the opportunities that come your way. And in a moment's notice, in one day, God can take you from the, the, the pasture and put you in the palace. He can take you from being a nobody to being a giant killer, but it doesn't happen overnight. It happens on purpose when you take advantage of the small things every day. So I want to challenge you, are you living your life on purpose? Are you just kind of going through life, man, I'm in survival mode. I'm just kind of just trying to get through today. Man, I don't, I don't really know where I'm going. I don't know what I'm doing. I don't know what my purpose is. Man, if you know what your purpose is, you got to a good place. This is a good place. We'll help you find your purpose. See, purpose is a big deal because if you don't know what your purpose is or if you're not connected to your purpose, you'll bail out of the fire when it's hot. You see, the fire is actually there to refine you and actually make you the very thing that God called you to be. But if you don't understand purpose and you're not connected to purpose, you'll never sit through the fire and you'll never get to confront your giant. So I want to challenge you this week Where do you need to live on purpose at? What small opportunities are you missing? What are the situations and the areas in your life where you're like, man, I could do better at being living on purpose in that area? Because giant killers aren't born, they're made, and they're made on purpose. 
and they're obviously made in the mundane. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for the day. God, I thank you that you called us to be a people of purpose. God, we thank you that the truth is that every giant falls and that every person in this room has the ability to become a giant killer. But it's how we handle the mundane. It's how we handle the small stuff. It's how we handle boredom and frustration. how we handle impatience and people that are frustrating to us and hard to love. God, let us be a people of purpose that you build into giant killers. God, let us be a people that won't short circuit the process and we embrace the very thing that you're calling us to. And we might be in a season where it's just mundane, it's just boring. But it doesn't mean nothing is happening. It means that a giant killer is being made. So God, let us be a people that will take advantage of the opportunities that come our way. And let us be a people that will live on purpose. God, we just ask that those that have come with heavy hearts today, for whatever reason that you would minister to them, that you would encourage them to get prayer after the service from the ministry team. God, we just declare that people are walking in victory this week. This is a great week for people. God, we thank you for what you're doing in the hearts and the lives of the people here at the well and in our communities. In your name we pray. Amen.